and ESG Investment Fund Symposium, an event organized by IBS Americas with support of universities from the United States and Europe. My name is Cesar Rigetti, Dean of the Sustainability, the Business Sustainability Research Center at IBS Americas, and today I will be the host of this event. It's nice to see you all joining our discussions today. Do not forget that at the end of this symposium, we are going to have a live Q&A session. So let's get started. Today we are going to talk about ESG, environmental, social, and governance factors, and their role in financial decisions. In 2020, ESG investing gained further attention as climate disasters and the coronavirus highlighted some challenges of society. As ever more asset managers launch funds with some type of ESG label, whether green, sustainable, or socially responsible, the many choices and comparisons can be daunting. In order to see how ESG works in practice, we are going to talk today with three professionals deeply involved in business sustainability. The first one will be conducted with Annie Matuzevich, an investment in strategies at Culvert Research and Management from the United States. The second speaker will be Sala Ahonen, the Vice President of Sustainability at Neste from Finland. And finally, we will talk to Louise Hesenmeyer, Officer from Corporate Affairs and CHR Hansen from Denmark. But at first, I would like to kick off by introducing some key concepts we are going to discuss today. Green investment is a very broad term. It can be standalone, a subset of broader investment theme, or closely related to other investment approaches, such as, such as SRI, socially responsible investing, ESG, environmental, social, and governance, sustainable, long-term investing, or similar concepts. So, to an investment in, co in a company to be considered green, such company must have a satisfactory level of sustainability in its operation and in, in its growth projects. This way, it becomes eligible for funding opportunities for investment banks. Pressed by NGOs, governments, as well as various stakeholders in general, nowadays, more and more banks start to implement sustainability criteria to define if a particular company can be funded or not. Well, but how exactly can we measure sustainability? Is there a chance that banks fail to objectively select those firms that are eligible to receive green funding? In fact, it is possible, really possible, to measure corporate sustainability quite fairly. Nowadays, the questions I mentioned before fall under what is known as a ESG investment. In general, ESG investing takes in consideration how companies' performance on sustainability dimensions affects its financials. According to a Morningstar direct report, a record $45 billion went into sustainability funds in the first quarter of 2020. Some financial giants like BlackRock, Morgan Stanley, and JP Morgan started to use ESG criteria in the investments evaluation methods. After the statement of the BlackRock about sustainability as a, as a key principle, nearly all major companies started to be challenged on how they could make profit and have a positive impact on the planet and on the society at the same time. But even in the corporate world, sustainable investing can be confusing. Now, a quick reca recap. ESG covers three main issues, environmental, social, and governance concerns. But since all the three pillars could be interpreted and measured in different ways, then searched SASB, SASB, the Sustainability Accounting Standard Board. The intention of this framework is to provide investors with comparable information about the companies and to allow investors and financial analysts to compare performance on an environmental, social, and governance critical issues within an industry. Take a look 
at the visual representation of SASB materiality map on your screens. You can see that the tool is highly comprehensive due to its global applicability and financial nature. These principles are indu industry specific, which helps investors to compare companies of different size in the same industry in a more objective way. And now that you know what ESG is and what tool investment banks generally use in order to evaluate sustainable performance, let's finally turn to our international experts that we have here today in order to see their perspective in this matter. Well, we will start from the investor side. So I would like to begin our interview with this focus woman from the investment bank. Let me give a quick introduction. November 2020, Morningstar, a famous investment research firm, released a new report, the Morning SG Commitment Level. The report evaluated the SG profiles of 40 asset managers spread across the globe. Calvert was one of the only six asset managers awarded as the top ESG leaders status by Morningstar. We are now going to talk to Anne Maruzevich, investment strategist at Culvert Research and Management from the United States. Good afternoon, Anne. Thank you for joining us today. First of all, I'd like to ask you, how would you define an ESG fund? And why are important players in the industry moving towards a more sustainable investing? Sure. So when we think about an ESG investment strategy, I think it's important to understand how the investor is making investment decisions using that environmental, social, and governance information. So an ESG fund being any fund that incorporates that information, whether it's data, whether it's views on specific environmental or social issues. And when we think about ESG, we think it's really important to think about intentionality and understanding that the investor is using that information to make decisions because they think that they're financially material and they're going to drive performance. But I think when you think about ESG broadly, there are certain strategies that may be more exclusionary that get captured in that figure you mentioned versus strategies like Calvert's that are much more integrated and robust in terms of their methodology around ESG. Okay, thank you, Anne. Now, talking about ESG methodology, could you please tell us about what methodology Colvert uses to evaluate potential companies applying for investment? How can we monetize the benefits for the environment and for the society? Sure. So I think that performance question that people ask a lot, whether they're going to sacrifice returns if they invest this way, comes from that lengthy concept of exclusions. So when you think about SRI in, in the 70s and in the 1980s was very much excluding certain industries. So if those industries performed well, you would underperform the broader market. When you think about ESG today, an integrated strategy that's using this information just like it would use fundamental information in making decisions, we don't expect that performance drag. So our view is that by taking an approach that includes this information, you have a more holistic view of how a company should perform. We believe that these environmental, social, and governance issues create real risk and opportunities for companies. So if we can evaluate that risk and opportunity and how a company is managing that, we should be able to predict, or we hope that we would be able to predict which companies are leaders which companies are laggards, which ones are improving, and use that information to make investment decisions. Okay, but could you be more specific in terms of how intangible assets are estimated? Is there any valuation method used at Culvert? Sure, so, so the way that our methodology works is we look at the peer group level. So looking at companies with shared, what we consider shared environmental, social, and governance risks and opportunities. Mm -hmm. And then we're evaluating those companies against one another to understand which companies are managing those issues better than others. And we come up with a rank system where we're able to actually score those companies and put some metrics around it using information around 
both the, what we consider structural score of a company, so the policies and programs in place, whether it's related to employee safety, product safety, greenhouse gas emissions, a variety of those issues, and then using that information to actually score those companies out, combining that, the structural score, along with what we can call a substantial score, which is looking at controversies. So when you think about a company might plan to do all of these great things, well then how are they actually implementing and in real time our analysts are able to look at news events and other things and understand, okay, if the company, there was some controversy at the company, how did they manage it? What was the scope of that? Are they likely to repeat that behavior and use that information to, to score those companies as well? So we combine that structural and circumstantial information into one score that allows us to, to make decisions regarding portfolio allocation. Thanks, Anne. Regarding materiality, that is to say, the information which would be considered relevant for an investor. Materiality has been changing over the time based on the evolution and importance of ESG issues. How does Calvert identify which ESG factors are more relevant or material within a given industry? Are the criteria for the evaluation of companies used by Calvert different from other investment banks? Sure. So Calvert's foundational in, in materiality, and when we think about it, we think about materiality at the, the sub-industry level, the peer group level. So the way our analyst team is structured is each analyst has sector coverage. And within that sector, they are responsible for creating an investment thesis around certain sub-industries that identifies the material ESG issues, the trends they're seeing. So to your point, these are evolving. And we there are issues that people may have not considered material when we think about carbon pricing or something like that, that now we know to be material. So the analyst's job is to really understand the current environment, but also the future environment and what they anticipate could be potential risks and opportunities for that group of companies. So they create their investment thesis at that peer group level. We use roughly 200 peer groups. So when you think about the current structure, you think about GIX industries, which are, you know, with the more traditional grouping and classification, what we consider is how are there, we think there are certain differences there. So we also utilize SASB's framework and we're very involved with the SASB group. We've been with SASB since they started. We sit on the advisory board. So we contribute to their methodology and their groupings as well, but we have kind of our own take on it. That's a little bit, a little different. What we think about is what are the risks and opportunities? What are the exposures? What are the business exposures? So when you think about your traditional groupings, you have hotels and cruise lines are grouped together. When we look at those two types of businesses, there are very different environmental risks for a cruise line versus a hotel. So we think it's important to pull those apart and identify those different issues that are gonna be material to financial performance. So our analysts go about creating those, that investment thesis, determining which issues matter. And then what we're able to do is look at an array of data from ESG data providers, from NGOs, from less conventional sources as well, and determine, okay, well, how can we measure those issues, those material ESG issues? So for each industry, you might see five, 10, 12 different issues being measured based on what the analyst considers is most material to performance. And then we're also using a financial sciences laboratory that's a partner we use to test the efficacy of those key performance indicators on price discovery. So understanding that there is that, that relation to performance and, and so our analysts can use all of that information to, to make their decisions. Okay, thanks. I think that now we all know more what methodologies and frameworks are used to evaluate companies. Now I would like to ask a question. Could you tell us more about types of investment for specific green projects? And what are the differences between these types of investments? Sure. 
So we have a green bond strategy. And I think that's an area that's really grown where we're seeing companies issue bonds based on certain green projects. We've seen a ton of growth there. I think you're also seeing in the municipality space um, is an area that we consider an impact area because it's, it's a direct use of proceeds um, type of investment, just like green bonds. What we're seeing more of today, which we hadn't previously seen, is, is social bonds. So I think we'd seen the E when we think about green bonds, but now we're seeing more of the S in terms of fixed income issuance. Very interesting. You mentioned that nowadays green bonds and social bonds have been rising in demand. Would that mean that ESG is going to keep being so relevant in the future? In other words, what's the future of ESG? Or it is hard to answer. Sure, I can try. Um, so I right. think this is, this is a growing space, as you know, and a lot of people are very interested in either learning about it, participating from the investor side. You see people who see it as a business opportunity and a marketing opportunity. And then you see it as people like Calvert who really consider ourselves having a dual mandate. So that dual mandate is investment performance and positive global impact. So coming back to that focus on intentionality, I think it's important when you look at different investment styles and approaches is, well, why are they incorporating this in ESG information? Do they really think it's going to affect performance or do they think that it's going to allow them to market their fund more? So we really want to hope people that look at how robust is their process, how deep is their research, how are they thinking about these issues and understanding that these issues are evolving and you need to evolve. And so if you're solely reliant on one or two ESG data providers and just using that information? Or are you really digging deeper and looking at the raw data and trying to understand how you can use this in your toolkit along with fundamental information to make those investment decisions? But I, you know, we expect this area only to continue to grow. The, what you guys are doing with the, the educational component is great. And that even when I was an undergrad, there were no options for a class like this. So I think it's mm -hmm. fantastic. And it's great to see from, from our end as a practitioner. So I, I think it's, you know, it's an exciting place to be and there's, you know, more to come. And as ESG becomes more and more mainstream, I think it's just going to be a requirement uh, for all investors to understand and implement. Okay. Sounds promising. And finally, I'd like to ask you the last question. What advice would you give to young professionals interested in working with ESG investments? I would say be open-minded. I think when you look at the career path of certain people on our team, it's not always traditional and that's okay. I think you can, there are a variety of different experiences that allow you to be good in, in this space. Um, demonstrating passion is really important, whether it's for particular environmental issues or social issues. Um, it, really being authentic in the space is important um, and, and just being eager to learn. There's so much to learn every day. I think I could spend another five hours reading and learning. So um, just staying you know, inquisitive and, and trying to absorb information is great. And you know, reach out to people and to just try to learn more. Thank you very much, Anne. Your insights are very important for us. Now we can see investors' perspectives on this issue. Really, thank you. Now that we know what banks expect from companies, we can ask the latter ones about their understanding of ESG concepts. We are now going to interview a representative from Neste, a company from Finland. Neste is an oil refining and marketing company which produces, refines and markets oil products, including renewable diesel, in sustainable aviation fuel and provides engineering services as well as lici li licensing production technologies. Currently, Nesta has operations in 14 countries and is the third most sustainable company in the world, according to the Corporate Nights Ranking 2020. We are now going to talk to Sala Ahonen, the Vice President of Sustainability of Nesta. Hello, Sala. Sala, how are you? 
Happy to have you here with us. You know, we have just had the participation of Colvert, an investment company here. Our goal is to compare the investor's perspective on ESG with the corporate one. Given the fact that you, your company hangs very high on sustainability rankings, Nesta is clearly a candidate for green funds. Could you tell us a bit about ESG in your company? Why has it become so important at Neste? I think it's been a long challenge. I mean, the company was founded in 1948 with the purpose of um, securing Finland's oil supply. And today the company, 90, uh, no, 80% of the profits come from renewables. So there's a big transformation. It's based on innovation done in-house. Already in the mm -hmm. 1990s, they came up with this idea that we can actually make diesel out of renewables. And then that was patented, but put aside. And then, you know, when the last time we had a big discussion on climate, so early 2000s, you know, the company started looking at, you know, we are an oil refining company and it looks like climate is becoming a big issue. So should we do something? And they made this really bold decision to start investing into um, refineries for the renewable product that nobody knew about, nobody was asking about, there was no legislation to support it. So I think that will have been a very, very bold move. And it took quite some time for that to actually become a profitable business. So it also needs to be kept in mind that, you know, the transformation doesn't necessarily happen overnight. So for this line of business, it took, you know, a, a decade for it to become an actually profitable business. And like I said, then last year, 80% of the profits is coming from the renewables. We still have also the fossil side, but, you know, when we look at where the money is coming from, it's definitely the, the renewables. And this is a long process and the transformation actually continues. So we didn't want to end there. I mean, we have given this, this commitment that we will help our customers reduce their um, greenhouse gas emissions by 20 million tons annually by 2030. So this is how the company is um, having a positive impact. So this is what we talk about as our carbon handprint. We are trying to help others reduce their emissions. But then we were looking at our own activities and we decided that we also need to bring down our own emissions. So we are also now made a commitment of, of reducing our own carbon uh, footprint. So we are targeting to have carbon neutral production by 2035. So this is also, you know, a big, big change for a company like Neste. So we are now looking at 15 years of, of working on this every day. And it's not something that can be done only by a sustainability department. And I think this is really critical. If you want to really transform a company, it needs to be done, you know, throughout the company. So for example, our climate commitments, they are part of the company strategy. So we have now strategic priorities. One of them is the climate. And we actually announced our carbon neutral production on the 12th of March, which is the day when the world closed because of the pandemic. And uh, yeah. it was a little bit annoying but it didn't slow down. I mean, seriously, we can still see that this is one of those things that the company is still pushing forward. And I think this is not just Neste, but you can see this everywhere, that somehow sustainability seems to have become more important and not less important because of COVID-19. And this for me shows that, you know, we've taken a big step from sustainability or ESG being something done by somebody else in the organization into becoming mainstream. And, and for us, I mean, that's the purpose of the business and that's where, you know, the future is. Thanks, Sala. And how did your company manage to reach such a high position on the sustainability ranking? What was the biggest challenge it faced in its journey towards more sustainable operations? It happened before I joined the company. So it's only yep. hearsay. <laughs> so I really think that it, it was about looking at, you know, because companies do scenarios and, and think about where the future is going and, and what is the role of this company in the future. And like I said, climate discussions were, you know, very much alive at that time. And then you have an oil refining business. And then you're looking at possible ideas of, you know, different kinds of uh, fuels being used. So you needed to reinvent a little bit the business. And, and that's what okay. they did. And then so. this year, when we decided the other thing that is transforming the company, so this carbon neutral production, 
and, and here again, we were actually also referring to the investors. So when talking to the board, I, I specifically mentioned, you know, for example, the letter from BlackRock. Yeah. I know this is showing yeah, yeah. that this is where the interest of the world is going. If we want to have a future, if we want to be a profitable company also in the future, we need to be part of this climate solution, part of the, the solution and not really creating problems. It's clear that your company is considered one of the most sustainable in the world. So it's eligible for many funding options. What's the advantage of ESG funds? Why would a company prefer a green fund instead of a regular one? In general, I think the sort of the green funding can be more interesting in terms of money as well. So you get better offers for for green investments than for other types of you mean it's a cheaper cheaper money would say yeah i think a... that that's what's happening these days but for us i mean mm -hmm. we are a company that has shares so you know it's about if there's enough interest in our shares the price goes up and now it seems that you know mm -hmm. there's a lot more companies willing to invest into companies that are good in their sustainability performance it's also already existing owners, so existing shareholders that have a lot of demands on sustainability. And, and this mm -hmm. is why we keep having this dialogue with different investors. Either they already have invested in the company, so they already have shares, or they are hoping to, to acquire some shares. But it's slightly different from you know, finding additional investment money. But I think for yep. both, sustainability has become really much more mainstream and much more interesting yeah. and i think this is something that is accelerating this this transition i see sala I'd, I'd like to ask the last question now our audience is mainly composed of young professionals and recent graduates what advice would you give to those listeners who are interested in working with csr and esg I think there is, you know, just one path and uh, I'm very proud of my team. Um, I think we have now 11 nationalities. We speak 18 languages. We have, I think, five, six different education backgrounds. I mean, we have engineers, we have people who study geography, we have lawyers, we have people who started, uh, studied economics. So it's more about how do you want to apply the skills that you have? And, you know, following where the sustainability discussions are going, seeing how my skill set helps in that. We have people who are experts in, in developing a sustainable supply chain, understanding what are the sustainability issues in different markets with different feedstocks. How do we follow that? How do we, you know, how do we build an auditing system that is credible? We have people who really understand the, the impact of climate both on, on the world and on, on the business and what can be done to mitigate that. So it's a very wide skill set. And maybe, you know, the most important for me is having an open and curious mind and the willing to keep learning. Because sustainability is an interesting area because it gets wider and deeper all the time. Yeah. Because, you know, you know yeah. we have both the social aspects that go to much, much, much more details. And when we also have the environmental aspect that keep growing, they you know, sort of everywhere. And then you need to have also people who have very detailed specific knowledge. And then you need to be able to bring all of this together and also link it to the business. So, I mean, I wouldn't say that, you know, there is a specific way that you need to go about, but, you know, just keep following what's happening and, and see what you can offer in that discussion. Oh, thank you very much, Sala. Thank you very much for your insights and your participation here. Really, thank you very much. We all know that oil companies are generally considered to be major carbon emitters. So there is no surprise that those firms have a lot of room for sustainable practices in order to stand out in the market. But what other industries that are not so evidently harmful to the environment what kind of initiatives should they have, should they take, in order to be considered green? In order to discover it, we are going to have the participation of CHR Hansen, a global bioscience company based on, in Denmark that develops natural solutions for food, beverage, nutritional, pharmaceutical.
pharmaceutical and agriculture industries. The company states that it works accordingly to the UN Sustainable Development Goals and managed to, to be recognized as one of the world's sustainability leader. Our talk will be with Louise Rosenmeier, Officer from Corporate Affairs at CHR Hansen. Hello, Louise. Thanks for being here with us today. First of all, Louise, I would like to congratulate your company for being elected the most sustainable company in the world in 2019 by Corporate Knights and the second most sustainable in 2020. It's a good track. These are impressive results. So the obvious question is, what's the key element in CHR Hansen that makes the company so well positioned in the list? And what were the biggest challenges that you faced? Yes, thank you. That's a really uh, good question and thank you for the introduction. So. Um, I think to answer that question, I also need to give some insight to our company because when you talk about uh, sustainability, ESG, what you choose to call it, it is really an integrated part of our product portfolio. It is in the essence of the pro products that we develop. It's also, of course, a natural reflection uh, in our corporate strategy and it's reflected in our purpose, which is to grow a better world naturally. So, so you can say it's in the essence of everything we do. Sustainability is uh, completely integrated. So um, you're right that we, uh, we have been uh, recognized as a global leader in sustainability for the past two years, which we were extremely proud about and still very humble about because it a, it's a big field and it, it's constantly uh, evolving and there are some really, really strong uh, players on that agenda. But... Um, but this ranking is really a testimony to the products that we develop. So it is uh, the result of the impact we can have through our products. And you mentioned it a bit in your introduction that every day more than 1 billion people consume our products, which actually means that um, even though they're teeny tiny, even though we make small ingredients based on bacteria, mm -hmm. we're actually out there. So through the very close collaboration we have with our customers, we actually, and through the food products that they produce, yogurts, cheese, or so on, um, we can actually have quite a big impact at, at a big scale uh, on some of the world's uh, largest challenges. And where we really try to focus our efforts is, of course, where we believe that, the, that our products can make the biggest difference. And that is on areas such as reducing food waste, uh, or reducing the use of excessive use of uh, pesticides or uh, antibiotics. So what we did a few years ago was to go through a very extensive assessment of our products. We mapped all our products, and that's more than 3,300 individual products that we mapped against the, um, the sustainable development goals. Really trying to look at what is it this product can do? What kind of impact can it have? Can it help uh, increase yield? Can you get actually more cheese out of the same amount of milk? Can it uh, reduce the use of chemical pesticides? Give the farmers a higher yield on the field? Can it improve health? Um, so going through all of these tr products and trying to understand what they can do. And most importantly, what kind of documentation and evidence we have to show for it. Um, and that, of course, is uh, based on the different types of product trials, clinical trials, R&D trials, to really build this whole database of uh, documentation for our products. And what we found out was that uh, now we're repeating this exercise every year, um, and more than 80%, it's been ranging from 81% one year or 84% this year, but Generally, more than 80% of our revenue comes from product that has a positive impact on the, on the global goals number, as you mentioned, number two, three, and 12. Wow. And, um, and that was one of the, the really important uh, things in this uh, recognition, that we had that full report and we even had our auditors reviewing uh, the methodology, the assessment, the calculations, and the evidence. So it is fully documented. Um, so that's been a really uh, strong um, task that we did. And then just to also answer your, your question about the biggest challenge, in doing that, and, and, and now that, that our products are really the, the focus 
area for us. This is really where we can make a difference. Of course, we're also focusing on the internal line. I can come back to that. But the products is where we believe that we can make the biggest difference. Then the challenge is really to, that we need to continue to build data. We need to continue to build evidence on what kind of um, impact we can have through our products. And, um, and that, of course, takes time to accumulate and to build. So we're continuously trying to initiate new studies, impact studies, clinical studies, to look at these, um, this impact in a different way. So that is, um, yeah, I think that's, that's what we also spend a lot of uh, time and resources on to really make sure that the, the foundation continue to uh, be strong. Thanks, Louise. Tell us more about the financial advantage your company has for being classified so sustainable. In other words, is it possible to say that CHR Hansen has better access to funds thanks to high rankings in sustainability? Do you have any partners that you count on regarding your ESG compliance strategy, for example, consulting firms or certification agencies? Um, to maybe start with your last question, we are doing, we haven't consulted companies in general. You know, we work really closely with customers. I think they are our pr primary partner in this because that, uh, that is where we need our products to be out and be alive in order to make an impact. So yeah. that is a really uh, important important part. Um, then I think when you talk in general about funding and being a sustainable company, I think the world has come to a place now where being a sustainable company can also be very good business. Uh, it's about understanding the risks. It's about understanding the change of the market. You know. Things are changing. We are seeing legislation, say, uh, legislation that is changing, taxation that are changing, all in favor of a, a more climate-friendly uh, future. So I think being on top of your uh, ESG and sustainability agenda is only a good business sense, um, which obviously should be able to attract investors in the in the last end. Okay. Let's think now about the other companies that are only planning to start the ESG journey. Do the benefits of attracting ESG funds offset all these resources and efforts needed to become a sustainable company, in your opinion? Yeah, um, I think you should uh, maybe not only do it with the purpose of attracting uh, funding. I think you should also do it with an interest to uh, serve the market make a change or a difference in the, in society. It's very, it's of course a val very value driven agenda still, but it's also a very business oriented agenda. We can see that our customers are setting out completely new requirements or higher requirements mm -hmm. also related to sustainability or ESG performance. Um, and we're doing the same for our own suppliers. But we also see that new business opportunities can arise because all of a sudden we can go in and partner with our customers on something else. Of course, the product is the focus, but if we can help them in their sustainability journey, that is also, you know, basically putting us in a different market position where there are more opportunities. So I think, of course, the investor side is, uh, is also very, very important when you're a company. But I think that you should also be aware of all the other benefits. And in that cost-benefit analysis, I don't think it can ever be a, a bad investment to look at the, the footprint of your company, both in terms of the, the negative footprint on how much you emit and how much harm you do, so to speak, but also in terms of where you can actually play a role um, in this world that we live in, where we are facing a number of challenges related to climate, population growth, and so on. And so, I think maybe just to add to that, I don't know if that makes sense, but uh, to add to that, that it's also, we see it very clearly that this is also something that the employees are very, very engaged about. So both in terms of being able to keep our employees and make them, you know, proud of the work we do, that they can see that there's actually an alignment between what we say externally and what we do internally, uh, but also in terms of being able to attract employees in the future. This is a because we, we see it all the time, especially young people, they want to work for a purpose-driven company. 
Yes, let's continue talking about employees. Which suggestion would you give to young professionals who are planning to work with ESG issues in a company like yours? Well, I think a little bit to my point that the um, that that the focus today has kind of shifted that everyone wants to work in this purpose-driven company. We see it clearly in our company that that sustainability is not uh, limited to uh, to a corner of the organization where we have two or three people working on the agenda. This is mm -hmm. something the entire organization is lifting. So we need the people in R and D to, to develop the relevant products. We need the people in production and operations to ensure that the, we're efficient and that our footprint is kept at a, a certain level and so on. So we need the entire organization. And I think if you have a, as a company, if you have a strong purpose and are able to continuously engage employees, it doesn't really matter where in the organization you're placed because you can actually make a bigger impact and difference in R&D, for example, than in, um, than in another, you know, in a specific sustainability uh, function, depending on the company. So I think it's, it's very much about the mindset you have mm -hmm. as a person applying for a job. Of course, you need to be passionate. You need to um, desire to uh, make a difference, mm -hmm. uh, be part of a change. Um, and then I think if you come into a company where you can actually see the, the greater purpose, you can make a big difference. And I think you should, uh, you know, that doesn't require specific competences. That can be whatever, wherever you are best. And then you mm -hmm. can make the change from there. Louise, thank you very much for your answers. Not that we know what investment banks expect from companies and what companies in turn have to do in order to be recognized as sustainable. We have a better notion of how ESG concepts work and transform the market. I would like to thank all our participants today for their valuable contributions. As our symposium is coming to an end, we are now going to start our Q&A session after a one minute break. Please send your questions in the chat and see you in a minute. Hi, hi everyone. So now we are, ha we are having our Q&A session. Uh, we are happy to, to mention that we have 140 people, 104 countries represented here today. Uh, so we received questions from all, all over the world. And the first question comes from Cabo Verde, Ghana, uh, in other countries. It, it came from Vanilson, Cabo Verde, Ebenezer, Ebenezer Mensa from Ghana, Abdul Latif and Jordan Seca. Uh, let's go. What are the sustainability trends in the current situation of the pandemic COVID-19? So our, our, our answer uh, that we thought here is uh, given the, the arrival of COVID-19, and its consequence to the society and to the economic. The relationship with nature and with science makes people more aware uh, and question about them, themselves, about their, their habits, about they, they, what they do. 
So some research in fashion industry, for example, uh, sh brought us some information about shoppers' attitudes and a rising demand for sustainability, for example. Uh, a study made by Sourcing Journal, 45% of brand sustainability professionals felt there has been more demand since the, the, pa the pandemic began. In July now, last July, another research made across 20 countries said that 72% of consumers' companies mentioned sustainability, that sustainability became more important to, to them because of COVID-19. And consumers in general have high expectations of their own behavior too. For example, more than half of them start to say that they will save more water, use less plastic, and, and save more energy. And we also have changes in finance, the finance market. For example, some, some big numbers here. In the third quarter of 2020, the sustainable finance sector reached a record of $155 billion performance. Sorry, uh, $155 billion. And this performance was driven by COVID-19 and widespread concerns about sustainability. Throughout the year, the values raised with green bonds and issue of sustainability bonds uh, grew strongly too, as we saw in the interview uh, with uh, Calvert. And another important uh, factor here, the continued growth of sustainable finance is largely due to social security. During the first nine months of 2020, they handled about $85 billion eight times more than the previous year. So we have a lot of facts uh, telling us that uh, COVID has changed people's uh, uh, behavior and the company's behavior too. So let's go to the second question here that we selected from many we received. It. What are the mechanisms to detect some te ten tendencies of companies to use sustainability performance data externally for greenwashing purpose, for example. This, this question comes from Brazil, from Rodrigo uh, Wagner Bressa. Well, the, the, this is a very good question. And many investors, especially to invest in investment ESG uh, oriented, want to make sure that companies are really ESG compliance when they, they invest there. Given the market realized that ESG companies are better prepared to face uncertainties and thrive, more funds are moving to these companies. So greenwashing is a quite new term to describe companies' reports with false ESG information. Fortunately, the professionals that evaluate those reports are well prepared. And what do they see? That is your question. So questions that they make. Does the company walk the talk? Are they consistently go doing what they say they do? What and how does the company used to do before ESG become an evaluation criteria? Today, covered mention, as we saw now, the materiality, materiality matrix that SASB uh, prepare, and we showed that in the beginning of the, uh, the symposium. How does the company address the, SA, the, the SASB elements? So SASB is one framework. You, uh, the finance company has some, some others. And they are specific by industries. So how does the, the, that specific industry is answering those questions? How does the, the, they perform each of those elements in the SASB matrix? So uh, another way those analysts capture greenwashing are, for example, historic of employees frequent accidents, many fines received by not complying with the law, news about bad use of natural resource. So these are all evidence that can be used to check if the company walk the talk. So we, I am virtually very, very optimistic that given the the, that the, the bar is raising regarding ESG, 
uh, is becoming more and more difficult, the greenwash pr procedure that you asked it. So let's go to the third question that we selected here. There are many. So um, this question comes from some places. Uh, I will say that from Canada, Senegal, and Kenya. And the question, in summary, is how to build a sustainable business. It comes from Jumana Baba from Canada, from Senegal, from Suleimani Niem, and from Kenya, from Shadrach Eliud. How do business, how do build a su sustainable business? That's the uh, general question. So I will answer this putting this way. How companies, how can companies' leadership, CEOs and board members, uh, create shareholder sure value having sustainability as a guideline? There, is, there are many sustainability frameworks that support business, business strategists. I like the sustainable value, value, sustainable value matrix from Professor Stuart Hart from Cornell. And, I, and we use this, this matrix when we teach here at uh, IBS. This framework is a two per two matrix and supports strategies to organize the parameters that are important for long-term shareholder value. Basically, is the way. This the, this, 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 that's the way we, it works. In one dimension, you put time, what the company is doing today, and what the company is, is going to do tomorrow. In another dimension, you take internal elements versus external elements, new perspectives and knowledge from the stakeholders. So when you have those four elements, today, internally, and the other extreme, uh, tomorrow, externally, you have four dimensions that you have to think the challenges in each of this quadrant and define the strategy your company has to answer to think sustainability. So we again we were going to study this this in the business business sustainability for leaders here at IBS. You're all welcome to to come with us. Uh, I'm going to the fourth question. I think this is going to be the last one, right, Marsha? Uh, so question number four. It comes from Brazil, from Joseph A.B. Oliveira. How come can we truly appropriate all the 17 SDGs, uh, even though the 2030 agenda does not represent regulatory mark to really attack locals into regenerative prospects? So, I will transform this question. The question would be, why are sustainable development goals important for business? How can they enforce without proper regulation? So, let's first talk, first of all, let's talk about SDG, SDG. What is that? In 2015, a process led by United uh, nations resulted in adoption of 17 global sustainable development goals, the SDGs, sustainable development goals, seeking to end poverty, fight inequality and injustice, and tackle climate change by 2030. The SDG cover bro broad challenges such as economic inclusion, diminishing natural resource, geopolitical instability, environmental degradation, and the impact of the cl climate change. They define the agenda for inclusive economic growth until 2030. So, the question, why are SDG, Sustainable Development Goals, important for business? Organizations can harness the 17 Sustainable Development Goals by four dimensions. One, drive gr growth. Two, address risk. Three, attract capital. And four, focus on purpose. Drive growth. 
Companies should, should identify how they can contribute to meeting the goals in a way that drives financial performance in the markets they operate in. For example, when, when a beverage company invests in improved water source by working to replenish the aquifer water they use, thereby also committing to provide access to clean water to people in those water stressed regions, the strategy aligns with SDG related to clean water and sanitation goals. Easy to understand. So the company works on improve uh, clean water and sanitation, is working for the business, but is also uh, working on uh, the 17 or two of the 17 SDGs. Second dimension, address risk. Companies may not be able to continue to create capital over the long term if the natural social financial manufacturer capital is being eroded as else, elsewhere. I mean, if the, the world is not going well, the business are not going well. Each SDG represents a, a risk area that is already representing challenges to businesses and society, and those, those risks are likely to only continue and grow if not addressed. Important that. So the business has to to be like a guard of these risks for the world. Supply chain, for example, are particularly exposed to effects of climate change and depletion of natural resource, which align with some SDGs. So uh, when you talk about uh, supply chains and natural resource, the companies has to be aware about what they, what's going to happen w with, with this natural resource. So when the companies work and taking care of this, they are working directly in the ESDG, in the some of the SDGs. Third important dimension, attract capital. We expect to see a redirection of investment flows, both public and private, toward the global development challenges framed around the SDG, SDGs. The UN, United Nations, estimates that the cost of uh, achieving the SDG will be approximately Four trillion per year. It's a lot of money. We believe that inno innovative finance models will be developed. The World Bank committed $23 billion through 150 projects to help developing countries find solutions to SDG aligned challenges. In the end of the day, let's say that if you have good projects good green projects, good projects that will save water, will reduce CO2, CO2 emissions, will improve the society, will uh, improve the governance uh, of your company, you may find better funds uh, for your company. So you don't need a specifically regulation to be incentive, to, to have the incentive to do this. Finally, the fourth uh, di dimension. Focus, focusing purpose, purpose. The SDG will likely have an important impact on the purpose of many companies around the globe. Contrib contributing to the SDG is a way to create shared value for all stakeholders and therefore business will be a strong driving force to galvanize stakeholders around a common shared outcome. So, well, in other words, uh, if a company is working hard, aligned, focused in the SDGs, and the SDGs are good for society, is good for the planet, th th those uh, themes are good mottos to bring inside the company and turn it into a uh, uh, purpose for the company that for sure will bring energy for all the group that works in that company. So again, uh, talking about those four drivers, drive growth, address risk, attract capital, and focus on purpose, we can say that the alignment of SDG and companies are not necessarily uh, driven only by regulation, but, only, uh, but also by those four drivers here. Okay? I think that's it for today. So I want to say goodbye for everyone. I'm very happy to see a large uh, group 
uh, in this audience. We have more than 5,000 people registered here today. Thank you very much for, for, for being here. And 140 countries, uh, I can say, from all over the world. So thank you very much, and I see you in the next uh, symposium. Thank you very much. See you.